This is a story of someone I knew and had cut ties with because he was a psycho. The first half will be to add context as to why I cut him off, and the second half is what makes it a let's not meet. I don't know if he uses Reddit, so I'll omit ages and locations. It started about four years ago when I was living in a friend's house while attending a nearby university. It was myself, my friend, his sister, and their parents. Roughly about two weeks into staying there, my friend's sister invited her boyfriend to live in the house too, and by all accounts, he was a pretty cool guy at first, very sociable and full of great stories. We often sat around the table for drinks or talked about life, having a smoke in the garden. Within the first month, however, as he started to get comfortable, cracks started to show in this veneer. He would rant about government conspiracy, how he was always a wronged party. He was big into Sigma male nonsense and martial arts and Christ did he have a temper. He had this big dog he always kept in a cage that was extremely violent when he wasn't around. The dog attacked his girlfriend and had to be put down, and that's when the guilt trips towards her began and the ranting became incessant. About two months later, he had the bright idea to live in a shipping container, mainly because the parents wanted him out and dragged his girlfriend along for the ride. I'm not talking about one of those chic little restoration jobs. This was a rented container in a storage yard among the outskirts of the town we were living in. He would intimidate and threaten the staff there constantly until they called the police. This of course was another conspiracy, and he became increasingly abusive to his girlfriend to the point where the family got involved to get her out of there. I stuck close to them, having to pretend to be on his side until we could safely get her out. They broke up, which he blamed me for, claiming that I was poisoning her against him to make her mine, and she has a new partner now and they're happy. We all blocked the psycho ex on everything possible, but he continued to harass them until eventually he disappeared. Or so we thought. Fast forward to last year. I started to receive messages over social media from several different accounts, blocking each one in turn when I discovered who it was. Some friendly and some hostile. And one of these profiles, however, was pretending to be someone I knew from university. We talked about life and how things were going and eventually I was invited to a house party, claiming that it was a free house and plenty of people were coming. I booked the time off of work, made my travel plans, and kept talking to this friend coming to the date of the party. I mentioned it to my friend's sister, and she was interested in going herself, until I mentioned the address, and she began to panic. The address in question was a property belonging to the crazy ex's father that was scheduled for sale. I waited until the day of the party and called the police to check the property, claiming a suspected break-in. They found five people there, including the ex. Parked out front was a butcher's van equipped for food storage and a collection of knives, hammers, and rope. Let's just say, I'm glad I didn't go. This happened when my best friend was 17 and a half and I was 17 in 1996. My best friend Chrissy and I are both smaller females. She's 5 foot 4 and at the time weighed 110 pounds but was a soccer player, very athletic and strong. I'm 5'7 and at the time I weighed 125. We were both blue eyed blondes and were often asked if we were sisters or cousins. There is a large reservoir on the outskirts of her town surrounded by a beautiful public park. We figured that we'd be fine to walk around in the park because of lots of people usually hiking there. I had gotten some really good quality weed and we were looking forward to finding a peaceful place to smoke someplace out in nature. I had my pipe ready in my pocket and we were pretty stoked. We chose to go out on a Saturday. It was a beautiful sunny day and there weren't too many people out there. We parked our car by the reservoir in the mostly vacant lot that had two other cars. We didn't see anybody when we got there. We walked around the water for a bit and then chose a trail to go up. It was about 80 degrees Fahrenheit out and we were sweating but we had some water in my small day pack. As we got about a quarter mile or so into the trail I started having a weird feeling. 
I looked at her and quietly asked, Hey, do you feel something off here? Everything's really quiet. Where there were usually crickets chirping and frogs singing, it was totally silent out. She looked at me and said, yeah, I think so, and then we heard some crackling of leaves about 60 feet behind us and a bit to the left. We didn't see anybody at the time, so we continued forward. We were both getting pretty nervous, and we heard the crackling again, this time a little bit closer. We still didn't see anyone, and each time we would continue forward, we would hear footsteps a little more behind us, and I thought that we were being stalked. There was a turn off to the left which led to a clearing by a large rock about 12 feet high with a large sturdy rope anchored onto it to climb up to the top. It was part of a steep hillside of the cliff. The rope to climb it was anchored to the ground as well so one could not move it and I told her, we need to get up that rock now. I think we need the high ground. She nodded and went up first with me right behind her. We flew up that rock clinging to the rope tightly and going as fast as we could. When we reached the top, we turned around to see an older man, probably about 45, with a slighter build, wearing a jacket, jeans, and glasses, coming into the clearing. He was about 20 feet away. He looked at us with a cold, vacant expression. I got goosebumps looking at him, so I shouted, Hi, will you please leave us alone? We're just trying to have some privacy up here. He didn't respond, and with a blank expression, slowly started walking towards the rope which led to the top of the rock. My friend at this point was really scared and asked, what do we do? I saw a large rock, about 8 inches and almost square to my right, so I grabbed it. I was surprised at how heavy it was, but my adrenaline was going, so I lifted it pretty easily, and I told her, look around for the biggest rock you can find fast, move them next to us. Hold the biggest one, and if the guy tries to come up, we throw them at him and hit him as hard as we can. Aim for his head. Fortunately, there was a pile of sizable rocks behind us to the left, like someone had made a ring to hold a fire on top of the rock and then move them away. She brought a few over and held a large one to herself. My friend and I stood close to the edge of the rock, holding our makeshift weapons. I looked down to the base of the rock where the guy was considering the rope. He looked up at us again with very cold blue eyes and no expression, and then he reached his hand for the rope. I shouted loudly, Do not come up here. If you try to come up here, you're going to get hurt. I held the rock close to my chest so he could see it. My friend was next to me doing the same thing and we had a pile of more rocks. He blinked his eyes and cocked his head a little bit, and then released his hand from the rope and silently backed away. He backed to the edge of the clearing, back through the bush, still watching us, and then we heard his crunching footsteps go back through the woods until we couldn't hear him anymore. We stayed on the rock for another 20 minutes, maybe a bit more, watching and waiting. There was no other way to access the rock except for the steep hillside covered with poison oak, so we didn't think he'd try it, and plus we'd be able to hear him if he did. After we didn't hear anything for 20 minutes, we decided to make a break for a car. We threw several rocks down to the ground. Mine hit the dirt with a particularly satisfying thud. Chrissy went first down when I was keeping watch in case he came back. When I was scaling down the rock, she was holding a rock, getting ready to throw it full force if he returned. Unfortunately, he did not. We each grabbed the largest rock we could carry, put a few smaller ones in our pockets for good measure, then headed back to our car on the trail, very carefully and quietly. The crickets were chirping again, so we felt that he had left, but we were still extremely cautious. We did make it back to our car without incident and quickly left, and that was the last time I've ever hiked in that park. As a teenager, I waited tables in a local restaurant to pay for the gas for my car. I met Mr. Creep there. In my naive mind, he seemed normal at first, despite the fact that he was 20 and wanting to date a teenager like me. 
Leaving my job after dark scared me, so I taught myself to get in my car, shut the door, and lock it in one fluid motion. It made me feel safe. One night, I was leaving work and had just gotten into my car when Mr. Creep seemed to just appear out of nowhere, yanking my door handle to try and open it. I looked into his eyes in the split second before he smiled, and what I saw absolutely chilled my bones. I don't know how to describe the evil that I saw, and from then on I was terrified of him, but I didn't let on because I was afraid what he might do if I told him that I never wanted to see him again. And after this, he constantly lied to try and impress me and try to invent ways of being alone with me, but my instinct was to run, so I avoided him. About two weeks after this incident, the restaurant got robbed, and there was significant evidence against Mr. Creep, just not the kind that allowed the cops to charge him. I sent all my text conversations with Mr. Creep to the police chief in hopes that it would help. Mr. Creep slithered away after that, but I always looked over my shoulder. About five years ago, he messaged me on Facebook out of the blue. He went on about this top secret military clearance as well as a huge acreage that he owned. It made me nervous and I felt like he was trying to spring a trap or something, but I tried to put it out of my mind. Then today I was looking at posts about an unsolved murder when I saw his mug shot. He is now facing murder charges as well as two other violent felony charges. I'm just so glad to know that he's locked up, but so overwhelmed about how correct my instincts were about the guy I worked with. I work overnights at a 24-hour diner. You can probably guess what company. I'm used to weird people and odd things happening, but tonight was just too much. The restaurant backs up to a field that has a tree line and my cook and I went out back to smoke. We could hear someone yelling in the distance, but we get a lot of homeless people that come through town that usually are harmless, so we just shrugged it off as weird and went back inside. Later, I came out again to smoke and throw away some trash in the dumpster that's next to the field. It was stupid to go over to it, but I hadn't heard him again. As I'm walking away from the dumpster, I hear, Hey! Come here. Hey, hey, come here. It was much closer than when we heard him yelling the first time. I went inside and got my coworker who owns a car with a spotlight on it. We shined it into the field, which, again, not smart, and we admit that, but we couldn't see where he was, but he kept saying, Hey, girl, come here. I called the cops by this point because it was just too weird. As soon as I got off the phone with them, he comes walking out of the field. He's an older man wearing a tan trench coat and my coworker and customer ran back inside because this dude was hauling it across the parking lot. He started to come towards the door and I called the cops again. My cook cut him off and told him he needed to go. The man was acting erratically, yelling at my cook and said, I'll end your life next time I see ya. He kept moving his jacket by his waist like he was flashing a weapon, but I couldn't see anything from inside. Cops get him down the road and an officer came by and basically said the guy's homeless and not mentally stable. No kidding. We told them everything that happened and my cook pressed charges on him. The officer told us that there wasn't anything they could do and he wouldn't give her his name so they let him go. It basically ended with, oh by the way. He's known to carry a knife in his waistband. Call us if you need us. Bye. He came back, again hauling it across the neighboring parking lot and back into the field, and we could hear him screaming, yelling, hey, come here, again and again. We got busy when the bars closed and haven't heard him yelling since, but I know he's still back there because I had caught him sleeping behind the dumpster before. My manager comes in the morning and I'm going to try and get her to let me take a picture of him off the security tape so I can warn the other third shift workers. The field that he's camping out in also backs to a middle school, but the cops said again there was nothing they could do. Hopefully he moves on and leaves us alone or the cops can get him on something where no one gets hurt. In 2018, 
I live with my partner and my German Shepherd in the Humboldt Park neighborhood of Chicago. I was 33 years old, and our neighbor was a fourth-floor walk-up unit, very typical low-budget Chicago rental in a changing neighborhood. The layout of our building is going to matter to the story. Our building had a total of 12 units. Mine and the three below me had a shared front entrance, and the other eight units were through a second entrance. All 12 apartments had connected back porches and stairs that shared a walkway to a rear gate which led to an alley. From the front stairwell, there are windows on each landing to the back porches, so you can see the back door of my apartment when standing at the front door through that window. We had good relations with our neighbors, especially those that lived directly below us and shared our front door. This was the thing that saved all three of us, my partner, my dog, and myself. My partner was in a touring band at the time and would leave for weekends for weeks at a time and it was a scary thing for me because I was actually hurt and stalked by my ex in my teens and twenties. I always worried something would tip him off and he'd start stalking me again. A little less than a month before a two week tour my partner had scheduled, I received a creepy Facebook message from that stalker ex from yet another new account. About a week after that, my car was broken into. The glove box was empty and things were thrown around, but the only thing that was taken was a bag of dog treats. I had about $20 and change in the compartment between the seats and they left the money. I was on high alert at that point and very scared about the time that I'd be alone during the tour. My partner was kind of irritated with me in the situation and felt that it was too last minute to cancel, especially over what amounted to be a bad feeling and a few isolated things that weren't direct threats. And truthfully, car break-ins are very common in Chicago. It happened to me like 15 times and police usually do reports over the phone and don't even come to the scene. What I found really strange was that the thief didn't take the money. There was a homeless man who had started camping on the boulevard nearby recently. My partner left for his tour and I set up cameras and bought door braces for my front and back doors. I became completely nocturnal, unable to sleep at night. My poor dog developed diarrhea, maybe because she was picking up on my stress level. It meant that I was taking her down all four flights of stairs for her to go blast her bowels six or seven times a night. I had the distinct prickly crawling sensation of being watched when I would take her out, but I couldn't tell what was genuine and what was my own fear and paranoia. Her diarrhea lasted an unusually long time, like three or four days. I was going in and out of the main door a lot, feeling very scared, and I noticed that some of my neighbors wouldn't pull the door all the way closed, so the lock engaged. I mentioned it to my downstairs neighbor one day, including that I was extra careful because of the stalker. He was supportive, said that he'd mention it to the other neighbors if he saw them, and I noticed that the door was locked more frequently after that. My partner came home at about 11 a.m. on a Sunday morning. At about 8.30 a.m. that morning, my first floor neighbor's place was burglarized. He was a metalhead dude who collected instruments and sold weed and psychedelics and lived alone. I guess he went out for breakfast and left his door unlocked while he was gone. Someone had come in, eaten the leftovers in his fridge, took a coat and a pair of boots, and left a filthy coat and a pair of boots, and took his college diploma but left $500 in the same cabinet. They left all the expensive musical instruments and mixing equipment, left the drugs, but did take a set of keys. The keys were to the first floor apartment, and a master key for the front door and the back gate. My neighbors ran into each other right after the break-in, and the second floor neighbor said to go tell me because I had a stalker. So my metalhead neighbor came up to let me know what had happened. My partner had just gotten home from his tour when he knocked at the front door. I jumped out of my skin but looked through the people, recognized him and the three of us stood on the stairs at the front door while he told us about the break-in. We jabber jawed for a while, about 15 to 20 minutes. And while we were talking, we heard the front door open and close below us, but really didn't think anything of it. Then we saw a man climbing up my back porch steps at the back door through the window. There was no other apartment that he could have been going to, and he had to walk past all 11 more accessible units on his way to mine. He was not my stalker, and I didn't recognize him. 
but his image is burned into my mind. He was wearing flashy black and white high top sneakers, not the ones stolen from downstairs. His black coat was oversized and hanging off of his shoulders. We locked eyes through the window and he froze halfway up the stairs to my back porch. He slowly took a cell phone and called someone as he slowly turned around halfway up the steps. He walked back down the stairs in artificial slow motion, as if he were pretending to be nonchalant and then bolted into a sprint as soon as he hit the porch below mine. My neighbor ran downstairs and dialed 911. My partner and I ran through the apartment to the back porch and saw a sedan and a windowless van pulling out from the sketchy building two doors down. Both cars floored it out of the alley. We didn't get the license plate numbers but the cops said that it wouldn't have mattered. There wasn't any crime committed and nothing concrete to justify stopping them. They very condescendingly explained this to me as they took my statement later. And my neighbor is the one who actually made the call and has the police report and my partner and I were just considered witnesses. For a long time, the thing that scared me the most was the tool that my neighbor found when he went running downstairs. It was a 2 by 4 piece of wood, cut to about 2 feet, but about 6 inches of it had been made into a handle. It looked like a paddle and for a long time I couldn't figure out what it was, but I'm pretty sure that it was a ram for the door jam and locks. When I looked at my door afterward it looked like the frame had been repaired, like it had been broken open before. It seems like they used the one master key to place their ram and get somebody at the back door to catch me if I tried to run out that way and somebody else was going to come back around since they only had one key and they'd break in my front door and go forward with whatever they had planned. When we caught them, before they could catch me unaware, they seemed to have aborted the plan. I suspect that they had been watching me, especially while I was taking out my dog and figured that I was alone. It was pure coincidence that my partner had gotten home 30 minutes before all of this. I feel that we all could have been horribly injured or worse had we been trapped inside and they had gotten the jump on us. Nothing else ever came of it, except that my landlord refused to change the locks, but he did agree to let us out of our lease. I moved out of Chicago, and now I've added a younger dog I'm training to do some bite work. My house is surrounded by cameras and floodlights, and I have wingnut neighbors. This happened when I was 10 years old. I was at a ski resort with my dad, stepmom, and three sisters. When this happened, my two sisters, dad, and stepmom were still out skiing, but my sister Ava and I got cold, so we went back to the hotel to get some food. We sat at the restaurant in the hotel until my stepmom came down. We asked her if she could hold the table so we could quickly go up to the room to drop off our ski jackets. So we took the elevator and once we got off, we started to walk to our room. And that's when I heard someone behind me say, Hey! Now keep in mind, we were both about 11 at the time. I didn't think he was talking to us, so I just ignored it. We walked into our room, but before we could close the door, the man stepped into the doorway. He was tall, probably about 6 feet and looked pretty old, maybe in his early 60s or late 50s. He was wearing the hotel staff uniform, but without the logos. The thing that raised a big red flag was that he was wearing black surgical gloves. He goes on to say, Hey, I was talking to you. We spun around, caught off guard, Ava saying, Us? And he replies, Yes, you. I was wondering if you could grab a picture for me and come into my room to pour some water for me. Our parents always told us never to trust strangers and we already got a bad vibe from him, so we politely declined. His tone then got a bit annoyed, and he said, It'll just take a second. Can you just come pour me some water in my room? At this point, we already knew this wasn't right, so we just said no again. This conversation went back and forth for about three minutes until we tried to walk into our room. Our instincts kicked in at this point, and I ran towards the door saying, Sir, we're good and I slammed the door on him. Ava and I sat in the hotel room for about 10 minutes, panicking about how we were going to talk to our parents because we left our phones downstairs. 
We looked out the peephole and he was gone, so we bolted down the hallway and ran back down the stairs to the restaurant. Once we told our stepmom, she was mortified and went to the office security. They interviewed us and asked us for a description because they didn't have any cameras in the hallway. We gave them the description and they told us that nobody with that description works there and that most of them were young, broke college students. At this point, it really set in that if I accepted and just helped him, I might have died. This happened pretty recently. I, 23 year old female, work in property management. I was not supposed to be working alone that day, but my manager and coworker called in sick, and my other coworker had requested time off that we all forgot about. I voiced my concerns because the property is in a crime ridden area, and I've had some bad experiences in the past. I actually transitioned to a different role because I no longer felt safe, but they offered me a lot of money to come back, so I did. The front door stayed locked during business hours so literally anybody could walk in. Also, it's a large and busy property. I needed someone with me just to help with all the tours and residents. Nobody was able to do anything so I called one of our sister properties and begged for their leaser to help me. They agreed but the leaser was going to have to leave early. I agreed and was just happy to have someone help. Flash forward to an hour before closing and the leaser had to go. Literally as she walked out, this disgruntled man walked in holding a duffel bag. I hate to profile him, but he was clearly homeless and not all there mentally. He walked up to me and handed me his ID. I asked him how I can help him and all he could say was, You don't respect veterans. I again asked how I could help him and he couldn't give me a straight answer. I was getting fed up when the coworker who had requested the day off happened to come in just to say hi. My coworker instantly knew something was off, so he came over to investigate. The homeless guy didn't like my coworker asking him all these questions, so he opened up his duffel bag and started sorting through it. He pulled out a piece of women's lingerie and threw it on my desk. Then he pulled out a box, and in that box was an SD card. He was trying to put it at my computer, and I told him to not do that. He listened to me, but proceeded to rummage through his bag. He seemed very irritated because... We kept telling him, if you can't help us, how can we help you then? You're going to need to leave. At this point, I'm getting scared that he's going to pull out a gun and just light us up. And instead of a gun, he pulls out a knife. Instantly, both me and my coworker started to scream at him to put the knife away and to leave. He eventually put the knife away but refused to leave. I messaged my manager who was out sick but lived on site to please call the cops and told him that there was a guy with a knife in the office. My coworker who was with me didn't physically force him out but he guided him out by walking towards him and making himself look threatening. Finally the dude leaves and we immediately lock the doors. He kept trying to come back in and was cussing up a storm outside. Eventually he made his way to the convenience store that is attached to the building. Within 30 seconds of him going in, about four squad cars pull up. We pointed at the store and they ran in there. The guy got aggressive with the police so they beat him and ended up detaining him. I told the police to look in his bag for the knife and they found it. I identified the weapon and answered some of the police's questions. I didn't press charges because this was clearly a mental health crisis and jail isn't going to reform that. He needs serious professional help. The DA pressed charges on my behalf and the courts granted me a protection order. They also let him go without bail. The last update I got was that he didn't show up to his court hearing and now there's a warrant out for his arrest. I wonder why. I have not seen him since that event took place and that's all I really care about. For context... I moved into my new house about a year or two ago. I had lived in the area for a year before, but we were evicted due to the owners of our old house wanting to move in. I'm a young female, still living with my family, which makes the story even more strange and unsettling. When you look out my window, you see my fence and then a house. 
They are up on a small hill so the fence doesn't block anything. The first encounter I had with this man was late at night. I was with some friends while all of our parents were out at a party. I will say that my friends and I are old enough to be left at home and we were responsible. We were just relaxing in my room with no light or music on. We had turned the TV off when we were alone. We heard my dog start barking for a good 10 minutes and we passed this off because she barks at absolutely everything, from birds on the powered line to bugs on the front porch, basically anything that moves. We started hearing weirder noises like crunching, circling the perimeter of my room and scratching on the walls. I kid you not, the moment we started getting scared, the loudest bangs I'd ever heard began pounding on my glass sliding door. My three friends and I ran out of the room to see what in the world could be making this much noise. We were greeted by an aggressive dog, which was up on the glass pounding on the door. My dog was scared. She usually doesn't do this, but she backed away behind me into the room with all of her fur up. Then we saw it. A man dressed in all black, standing at the door. We were all standing perfectly still, but I guess my friend's flight response kicked in and just as he had jumped to lock the door, the man reached for it too. My friend yelled, What are you doing here? Who are you? He responded with a simple, I don't know, and walked off with his dog, which was on a leash. When our parents got back, we told them about him. They asked us why we didn't call them. Truthfully, I know we should have, but... I didn't want to ruin my mom's birthday party, and I have learned from this. Two days later, my mom confronted our neighbor who was mowing the lawn. He said that it was, in fact, him and that his dog had run into our gate and he got the dog back. He said he meant to come and talk to her earlier about it, but didn't. I thought it was a normal story until I thought back to that night. The gate that his dog supposedly ran through has a tough clasp that was shut on that night, we have it there so our dog can't get out, and so nothing can come in, but you can open it by hand, meaning that this man opened the gate and let himself and his dog in. My theory is that he heard the music stop and didn't see lights from his house, so he decided that he was going to come and, I don't know, rob us. The noises we heard must have been him, scaling the perimeter of my room for ten minutes before attempting to enter. We filed a police report and... Nothing happened for a few months until one night. I was in bed, almost asleep but still getting comfortable. I set up to rearrange my pillows and turned around to make it more comfortable when I saw a face outside my window, staring back at me. Whoever it was was wearing a black face covering and I texted my mom and froze. I heard movement and then my mom came and checked and nothing was there. This wasn't just my imagination as my neighbor's lights are visible from the crack in my curtain but the face was covering a majority of the light. Ever since then, I have noticed them watching and whenever I catch them looking, they get up from their balcony and leave. I'll catch them watching in the same spot only five minutes later. Something like 10 years ago, I got my first ever dog, a toy-sized poodle puppy. She was way cute and also way too smart for her own good. She quickly learned that little, little kids, elderly ladies, and people who wore pink and sparkly stuff loved puppies, so much that she could get people food from them. Well, one day she escapes the yard while I'm vacuuming the house and I end up going all over searching. I started on foot then decided that she must have gone far, maybe got out right when I started, and so I got into my car and started driving all over the neighborhood, calling for her and showing people walking by pictures of her and asking if they'd seen my puppy. As I'm driving around hollering for her, I see some kids on their lawn playing with Barbies. They look five to six years old maybe, and they hear me calling for my pup and come running up to ask what kind of puppy I lost. I was going to show them my phone picture and then realized that this is the exact scenario they use to teach stranger danger. So instead I was like, go get your parents, I need to talk to them. One girl did, but the other stood there, even put her hands on the window sill of my car and asked if I had the puppy in the car. 
At the time, my only thought was for the parents to hurry up because I really didn't know what to do. So the mom comes out and has a total panic over her child being right up at a stranger's car and comes running over. I explain to her that I lost my dog and I give her my number and show her the picture. But I doubt she believed any of it because she just scooped up her kids and carried them into the house. I just wanted to share the story because that day, I was the creep. And if you're wondering if I have found my puppy, I did. Or rather a neighbor did. She had gone into his chicken coop and fallen asleep in a nest full of eggs and got sat on by the mama bird. When he went to collect the eggs, he was surprised to find a very waggy-tailed chick. I'm currently an 18-year-old female, but the situation happened in 2021 when I was just 16. It was around 3.30pm in the afternoon and I was returning home from my tuition classes. At that time, there was a high spread of the pandemic so the school was happening online. Still, I had no other option than to go and take notes from my teacher because there was an important exam coming up. Normally, I wasn't allowed to go outside because my knowledge of roads and areas was pretty poor. However, my teacher's house was about three kilometers away and on the same route as our old apartment, so my parents allowed me to go. On the way there, there was a puchka stall, a popular affordable and delicious snack in our country where I knew the shopkeeper since childhood. As I was walking home from my teacher's place after fetching the notes, I decided to snack on some of these puchkas and have a chat with the kind shopkeeper. The roads were somewhat empty at the time, with most of the shops closed and only a few passerby here and there. While I was eating, I suddenly felt someone touch my hair from behind, which startled me. I had a ponytail. When I turned around, I saw an old woman who appeared to be homeless, probably in her 60s or early 70s, smiling at me. She asked if I could buy her some snacks. At the time, I felt awkward and didn't know how to refuse, so I just said, yeah, sure even though I didn't have enough money. I asked the kind shopkeeper to give her my share of the snacks that were left. I didn't really mind this, but as I was about to leave, she firmly grabbed my right hand and said, God bless you, child. If I could see my granddaughter, she would be just like you. And so on. I was awkwardly smiling and nodding because I felt uncomfortable. And I did try to politely pull my hand away from her grip, but she didn't let go. Then, she started talking about how she had raised her daughter and son and how her husband, who was a rich man but a drunkard, used to mistreat and assault them. She explained how she had kept silent about it because of the money. Later, when her children grew up, got jobs and got married, her husband got into gambling, lost all of his money, went into debt and eventually died of liver failure. Now she was helpless and went to her children for help, but they resented her because they were greedy and refused to assist her. She shared how she had lost everything and went on for the next two hours. I sympathized with her, but I also realized that it was getting late to return home. The woman had a very eerie body language, and she started asking me about where I lived. Unfortunately, I told her about it at the time. She asked for my dad's name, and I shared it with her. She claimed to know him and started saying positive things about him, describing him differently from how I knew him, which was strange because I looked more like my mother. At this point, I became uneasy and tried to pull my hand away, but she wouldn't let go. She kept insisting on taking me to her home and feeding me some sweets. That's when it struck me that she couldn't possibly take me to her home, given her earlier story. I got frightened and told her that I needed to get back home because my parents would scold me if I was late. I started using more force to free my wrist from her grip. She resisted and even tried to drag me towards a dark lane by the road, saying that I had to accept her return gift. Finally, I managed to pull my hand away with all my strength and ran straight home. And as I reached my house, I was breaking out in a cold sweat. My parents were understandably angry and confused when I explained this whole entire crazy situation.
this happened to me a few years ago, probably back in 2017 when I was 14. I still think about this encounter almost every day. My dad lives near a small lake in Wisconsin. There are only about a hundred people who live in the neighborhood. My brother and I spent every other week up there, so we knew pretty much everyone. My dad's house was the second house to the top of this large hill. At the very top is a gas station and the diner where I would work over the summer. At the bottom of the hill was the lake and a small beach. That morning, I was waitressing at the diner and at the end of my shift, I bought a slushie from the gas station and was planning on going down to the beach for the afternoon. Parked outside the diner was a gorgeous teal vintage car. I'm not sure what brand, I'm not good with that kind of stuff, but it seemed to be from the 60s and it caught my eye. There was an older man in the driver's seat and his wife was in the passenger seat. They had their windows up and I wasn't too close so I didn't get a great look at them but I did notice that they were looking at me. I didn't think anything of it and started walking home. On my walk home I remember wondering where they could be from. We don't get many tourists and I would have remembered if someone drove a car like that. The diner was off of a pretty quiet highway and it was rarely used by out-of-towners but I assumed that they were just driving through. My younger brother and I went to the beach that afternoon and hung out for a few hours. When we decided to head home, I packed up my stuff probably a minute before he did and started walking home before him. On the walk up the hill, there was probably half a city's block's distance between us, and he could clearly see me, but we were too far to talk. I heard a car coming towards me and looked back and moved to the side of the street. It's the car that I saw earlier at the diner. They slow down as they approach me and I kind of start to get nervous. The woman in the passenger seat rolls down her window and I nearly crap my pants. They both seem to be wearing hyper-realistic latex face masks. There seemed to be no beginning and end to the mask and there weren't noticeable holes for eyes, yet their eyes definitely seemed real and there was no seam at the edge of the neck. If they were wearing masks, they were some of the best masks that I'd ever seen and must have cost a fortune, but it definitely wasn't their skin. There's no way. Something about them was just so off. The woman asked me for directions to a highway I've never heard of. I didn't drive yet, so this in and of itself wasn't weird, but I pointed them to the highway by the diner that leads out of town. They thanked me, rolled up the window, and drove away. I ran to my brother and told him what happened and he said they looked pretty normal when they drove past him, but they looked normal to me that morning as well. The masks were too good. He had to be close enough to notice how strange they looked. There was just something so unsettling about them. They didn't really do anything odd except asking a girl who was clearly too young to drive for directions, but it was a very small community. I might have been the first person they had seen in hours and it was just the way they looked. I'd never seen anything like it, and I haven't seen anything like it since. I mentioned it to my dad when I got home, but he didn't have much to say about it. I still feel deeply unnerved when I think about it more than six years later. I don't believe much in the paranormal stuff, and I do think that they were human. But why the mass? What were they doing there? And why ask a child who was obviously too young to drive for directions to a highway? Has anyone ever experienced something as strange? is this before. A few years back, I, a 23-year-old female, was driving home after taking my dad to the airport for a late flight. It was already dark when I left the airport and I still had a three-hour drive home. A few hours into the drive, I get recalculated to some windy back road highway. There were no cars or street lights, so it was pretty dark and pretty creepy. As I turned to curve, I noticed a black car come out of nowhere and start to ride my bumper. Then the blue lights. The road was so dark that I had to drive for a minute to find a spot with at least a few lights where I could pull over. The officer came up to my window and asked me if I knew that my tags were expired. I thought it was kind of odd because I was driving my mom's car and she's usually pretty on top of those things but it was more so the way he talked that made me uneasy. He was speaking pretty fast, like he was in a hurry or something. As he's standing at my window, before he even gets my license and registration, 
His radio beeps and tells me that he has to go to another call. He practically runs back to the car and speeds off. I head back home, half weirded out, half thanking God that I didn't get a ticket, and I kind of brush it off until I go outside of my car the next day and find that my tags were not due to expire for two more months. It could have been a simple mistake, but I couldn't help recalling how weird the whole incident was. He could have misread the number, but looking back I wonder what could have happened if he was someone with bad intentions. From then on, I pull over only in well-populated areas, and if a safe option is unavailable, call 911 to make them aware. It's been about 10 years since this happened, but I still remember things pretty clearly. I should note that this is told from my perspective, and I wish I could get my mother's perspective on it as well. She just doesn't remember the events as well as I do. And for context, I lived in a mid-sized city in the southern United States, where the main thing to do at the time was to go to the mall. Sure, we had movie theaters and a couple of bowling alleys, but besides that, there really wasn't much to the city. My mom worked at a department store located in the mall, and having nothing better to do, I would regularly go and sit in the break room while she worked. It gave me a reason to get out of the house, and if I wanted to, I was allowed to walk around the mall or get something to snack on in the food court. Honestly though, I was shy and preferred to just stay cooped up in the break room, playing video games on my Nintendo DS. My mom's co-workers were generally very sweet to me and frequently popped in to say hello or just check on me during downtime. If I was lucky enough to go with my mom on weekends, I could usually convince my mom to pick up my friend. We were actually dating, but since we were both girls, I didn't want that to get out, to go along with us. Going to the mall meant that I was free from doing chores at home, but it was a cheap way to sneak a secret date in every now and then. My girlfriend, though, never really liked staying in the break room with me. She always wanted to walk around the mall. I should note that she really enjoyed taking walks, so it wasn't out of the ordinary to want to do so at the mall as well. I just didn't like walking as much as she did, so I tried to weasel my way out of it whenever I could. I could usually convince her to walk over to a nearby store and look around or go grab something from the food court rather than walking, but... I noticed pretty quickly that she wasn't trying to actually get me to walk around. She just didn't want me to be in the break room. And now my girlfriend was more perceptive to things than I was, and I assumed that she just didn't like the ambience of the break room for some reason. And for a little while, I let it go. But eventually, I got frustrated and asked directly what was really bothering her about the break room. I thought she was going to tell me that it was too cramped or the lights randomly cutting off made her uneasy or something, the things that bothered me about it too, but no. What she told me was that she heard things in the ceiling, like someone was walking around in there. I had learned from my mother that there was a room in the ceiling, but it wasn't for walking around, it was for maintenance. Most of the stuff in there was wiring and insulation, but... Technically, someone could get up there, so I told my girlfriend this and said it was likely an employee up there fixing something. She said that was fine, but she didn't really like it and still preferred to just walk around or sitting in the food court. I understood her discomfort and wanted to help, so I agreed. We had a really good relationship in the sense of communication, and though I got frustrated, I wanted to make sure that she felt comfortable. Later that day, I mentioned what my girlfriend had told me and asked what they were fixing in the ceiling. Though my mom looked distressed and said that they hadn't been up there fixing anything that day, but she wanted me to see something. My mom took me into the receiving room of the department store, which was just a room off in the back filled with boxes and random junk the store was going to put out for sale. The layout of this room, though, was sort of an L shape. One part of the L was used for receiving, but the other part was the way into the ceiling. I should clarify for this next part that to get into the ceiling, the store would have to call for the mall's maintenance team. They didn't have a ladder or anything on hand to climb in there, as it would have been a safety hazard. The only thing that this particular area had was a hatch that led into the ceiling, and that was it. So needless to say, I was horrified to see what appeared to be claw marks 
leading up the wall to the hatch. I still remember the way they looked, brown gashes that had been dug into the concrete wall of the receiving room. I asked my mom if it was some sort of prank, but she told me that it wasn't the first time that it had happened, and she had no way of knowing I would even ask about it. According to her, these weird carvings had shown up several times over the course of a few months. Each time the store would call in the mall security and maintenance teams who would clean the wall up and then go into the ceiling to investigate. Nothing had ever come of their searches though and they eventually gave up dealing with the marks. The only explanation mall security could give was that it was likely a homeless individual who had made their way into the ceiling by sheer willpower and happened to be very good at hiding during the searches. I stopped staying at the mall with my mom after that and any time I wanted my girlfriend to come over, we found somewhere else to go during the day. Sometimes she'd just come over to my house when we watched TV or whatever, but I didn't feel safe going back to the break room after that. I knew nothing had happened up until that point, but I just didn't want to risk it, honestly. So to whoever or whatever was walking around in the ceiling at my mom's workplace, I hope we never meet again. I, a mid-twenties female, went to the local grocery store tonight at around 5 p.m. It's winter and getting dark by 5 where I live. I was in an aisle, taking my time deciding between the options when this late twenties, early thirties looking guy with light features, glasses, and a scruffy beard comes right next to me and just stands there. I didn't think much of it or even look at him at first because I figured, whatever, he's just looking too. But then after a few seconds, I noticed that he wasn't moving or doing anything, just standing there. So I looked at him, and he was already staring at me, and for half a second I thought that he might say something. So I stood there for a second just looking back at him, and he didn't say anything, so I just turned and walked fast away. At this point, I'm thinking, okay, that was weird, but whatever. Probably just an awkward guy who doesn't know how to talk to women. Then, not 30 seconds later, I'm in another aisle and I see him out of the corner of my eye coming down the aisle I'm in, again staring right at me. So again, I walked away as fast as I could and just went right to the self-checkout. While I was at self-checkout, I'm looking over my shoulders the whole time making sure that he isn't behind me anymore and he's not. I start walking out of the store relieved that once again I was just being paranoid and I wasn't ever in any real danger. As I'm walking out I decide to look behind me one more time and there he is, right behind me. I then notice that he has nothing in his hands, no groceries and he's heading towards the door right on my heels. Without even thinking I just stop dead in my tracks. I look right at him again and he's already looking at me and then he puts his head down looking at his phone and walks past me out the door. He bought nothing. I'm so scared at this point my head is spinning. I didn't know what to do. I can see my car because I parked close to the exit, thank goodness, so I call my fiancé and sprint as fast as I can to my car. I jump in, lock the doors, and start looking for this dude. Then I see him. He's aimlessly walking around the parking lot through the cars. He's pretty far away from me at this point and I have my fiancé on the phone so I'm feeling somewhat safe again. I watched him walk around for another few seconds before I got out of there. I have no idea what this guy was doing or what his motive could have been. Maybe he was just a weird dude who doesn't know how to talk to girls or maybe he was a predator with a dangerous intention. Or maybe he thought I just look like easy prey for a robbery. The thing I can't really wrap my head around is the fact that each time I noticed him, he was already staring at me. He was not discreet at all, and I would think a dangerous predator might be a little more inconspicuous. He also didn't buy anything from the grocery store, which I also can't understand. I was in the store about five minutes before I noticed him, so I'm sure that he didn't follow me in the store. Am I just being paranoid? There's a lot that didn't feel right, so I'm having a really hard time trying to rationalize this experience. It was definitely a creepy encounter.
I was shopping with my toddler when an older lady, maybe around 70 years old, who was by herself came up and said, Ma'am, just so you know, all canned veggies are on sale for 50 cents this week. And went on about how it's a great deal and they don't run it often. I replied, Thanks, I appreciate the heads up. And I'll definitely grab a few on my way out. She began to walk away, almost out of sight, and when she stopped and looked back, smiling at my son. She then asked how old he was, and I responded, Oh, uh, he's just over a year. She then asked if he was my only child and some other random questions about him. Then she said, Hey, uh, I just remembered, I have some clothes in my trunk, all boy stuff in, in your kid's range, and she asked if I wanted them. I politely declined, saying, We'll be shopping for a while. I don't want to hold you up. She insisted. Oh, not, not a problem. I'll just wait outside, and then I can come back in and find you before you leave. Are you a single mom? Would you need them? I got this gut feeling that something was just off about this lady, so I said, Nope, I'm not a single mom, and we have all the clothes we need. I thanked her for the offer. She tried a few more times, saying things like, I just don't know what to do with them. If you could use them, I'd be happy to give them to you. At this point, it really felt like she was trying to lure me and my son to her car. I continued to decline the offer and walked away. I did a few more laps around the store, looking for things I needed. At one point, I saw her standing in an aisle in the center of the store with a younger man, just sort of people watching. I could just be super paranoid and she was just a sweet old lady trying to be nice, but something in my gut told me to get out of that conversation as quickly as possible. I feel like parents will know that having a small child with you makes strangers talk to you all the time and make small talk about your sweet kiddos, but this conversation did not feel the same as the others I've had while out and about with my son. Has anyone else had a similar experience? Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams on Sundays, Tuesdays, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash letsreadofficial, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. If you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, always keep soy sauce in your hoodie.